her next presentation uh, coming up. Uh, that presentation uh, will be um, featuring Katie Gross, our chief customer officer at Suzy. And Katie is going to be hosting a panel discussion uh, featuring Elliot Rosen, uh, growth marketer at Unilever, and Jeff Cologne, who's the head of brand studios at Microsoft. And they're going to talk a little bit about how they've successfully navigated this crazy year and what their plans are for leading innovative, uh, pro innovative programs, uh, market research-led programs going into 2021. So uh, really excited to kick it off and uh, on to Katie. Take it away. I want to thank you all for joining us for the State of the Consumer 2021 panel. Now, this panel is designed to look at, uh, to give you a good look at how some of the top companies in the world are innovating their insights programs in 2020 and how companies are bringing in people from different experiences and different backgrounds into the world of market research. I'm Katie Gross. I'm the Chief Customer Officer for Suzy, and I'm joined on the virtual stage by two powerhouse insights leaders, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. So I will start with you, Elliot. Hi, I'm Elliot. I'm a growth marketer at Unilever. Um, I don't know if you already had an introduction before we started here, but uh, my background um, is mostly in growth and conversion rate optimization. And around two years ago, I made a pivot into consumer packaged goods with Unilever. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Elliot. And what about you, Jeff? Hey, I'm Jeffrey Cologne. I'm uh, head of the brand studio at Microsoft Advertising. Um, a a lot of a B2B background, let's say, over the last maybe decade, but then before that, a lot of B2C. So like Elliot, how do you take the best of both worlds, combine them together, and uh, figure out how to reach uh, consumers who are probably similar in both of those uh, sectors? Absolutely. Awesome. So let's start with some questions about your non-traditional backgrounds. So in the rapidly evolving world of market research, we've seen that more and more you don't necessarily need a traditional market research background to be able to drive the insights process um, and to make a serious impact on businesses. So Elliot, I'd love for you to share with the audience a little bit more about your background and kind of how you found yourself in the world of market research and insights. Sure. So I'm like fresh into market research, but my background is primarily in growth marketing, acquisition marketing, performance marketing. So a lot of, you know, behavior based data. Um, I think we often talk about how we as like a growth marketer, or someone who deals with uh, paid media, you get a really cold sense of what consumer behavior is like, because you're just basing it off of uh, on page behaviors, click through rates, conversion rates and stuff like that. I think what consumer research does is adds a layer to that, where you're starting to kind of see the things that they might not explicitly show with their actions or what a consumer might not necessarily be saying, but speaks deeper to their preferences, their beliefs, and their opinions on products and brands. Mm -hmm. Great. And Jeff, what about yourself? How did you find your way into market research? And what was your background? Yeah, um, you know, so market research, we have a tendency of thinking it's something that's, you know, a decade old or 15 years old when people started to behave or be online more. But, uh, you know, it goes back several decades. And then, of course, I think when it comes to data science, you know, a background in the social sciences is very helpful, especially in this day and age. Um, so I think that's, you know, really where most of my um, experience had come from, I did a lot of market research actually in the music industry, which was sort of my first, uh, uh, you know, job like in the working world. And, and, you know, when people say they have, they have a tendency of using data, I sort of have to laugh at that because we've been using tons of data for the last, you know, three decades, digital types of data, Arbitron, SoundScan, other forms of data to figure out, you know, where to go. Uh, in terms of marketing and artists. And that is now, you know, all applied in terms of how to uh, market to consumers. So I th think um, it's important for all of us to realize what's happening in market research is just a remix of what's been going on the last 30 some years. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so what do you think it is about your role today that really requires you to be more deeply integrated with the insights at your respective companies? And uh, we'll get started with you, Elliot. Sure. So I work within the beauty and personal care portion of the portfolio, specifically with new business creation. So exploring um, a new niche or a new business model. And a lot of that has to do with validation. So if you look at like a traditional way or a traditional way of thinking when it comes to launching products and brands and new business models is there tends to be a 
old school view that it has to go in blocks, like three year blocks, two year blocks, one year blocks. Um, and doing anything faster is sort of deemed impossible or you're, you're just moving too quickly or you're gonna break things. Um, with new business creation, what you wanna do is be able to validate your assumptions as soon as possible. So what I see the value of using consumer research and validation process is to bring consumers in earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, and this sort of becomes the data that you're getting is not definitive answers. It's sort of like the performance enhancing drug that helps decision makers within your brands. Cause ultimately it is people making these decisions, not platforms, tools, or, or data, but that consumer research really fuels your decision-making process and allows you to make better and faster decisions. Yeah. Wonderful. Consumers are the performance enhancing drugs for companies. <laughs> Jeff, would you agree there? <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, there's um, there's a place now in our world for long term research. I mean, that's never going to go away. Research that might be over a uh, one year, three year or five year period. You want to sort of see what the longer changes are. But there's also a need of understanding, you know, what are the changes that might be month to month? Um, that's applicable as Elliot noted. If you're going to go for if you're actually trying to introduce a product into market, it's one thing to do research over a long period of time, but then it's good to sort of understand what's happening in the moment before you possibly release that uh, product. And that way your team can actually make updates to, uh, to that, figure out where the best place to start sales on that might be. So I think you know, a lot of uh, research, the ability to have more real time in specific situations is, is becoming more and more relevant. I think we've always wanted it, but now we you know, technologically uh, you know, with solutions like Suzy, we can actually have that. So I think that's that's important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now we mentioned that you both do not come from the market research world. So what were your perceptions of market research and market research teams before you got involved and before you started? And Jeff, we'll actually start with you on uh, your perception of MR before before joining it. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, if you think about market research and, um, you know, how it has worked for for you know, in the old days of like, let's say research and development, I mean, you thought of a team that um, had a number of different people with skill sets on it, which is important. I think that's, that's still important in this day and age. Um, but it may have been weighted very heavily with, uh, especially in the last decade, a lot of uh, data scientists with PhDs, not cutting on that whatsoever. That's still very important, especially when you're trying to figure out machine learning models. But what we're trying to get at with a number of our research questions now is, you know, what are those questions and do they actually leave more answers out there that uh, are, I should say, more questions out there that we have to figure out how to answer. That's not necessarily a bad place to be in the, in the world where we're trying to figure out, you know, how to navigate a number of different areas. And every vertical that's out there, Katie, has tons and tons of questions that need to be answered, solutions that don't necessarily exist uh you know product fits that people you know companies are trying to you know figure out from a marketing standpoint also you know companies trying to figure out like what is that marketing fits you know who do we go after to actually get people to adopt a, a solution especially in b2b we see more and more of that i think what's happening is the last 10 years very heavily weighted in the technical area and what we've seen over the last you know two is now more of a of, a, of, a, of a teams being rounded out with uh, people with humanities backgrounds people who might want to understand the psychology of why people make the decisions that they do or don't make the decisions that they do uh, again I think these things have existed for a while but now we have tools that are that are able that we're able to actually formulate a number of questions without having to build out a machine learning data set and, and get those answers to it. So I see more diversity is the is the long answer to this question on a lot of research teams that didn't exist over the past couple of decades. Yeah, definitely seeing a similar thing. And obviously, Elliot, you came from outside of market research also. What were your perceptions before you, you moved into to market research and, and how is that changing now? So I probably had some pretty bad biases. I thought it was like, A, very bulky and expensive and slow. It's a big beast. Mm -hmm. um, I think kind of piggybacking off of Jeff's response is B, I thought it was very, it was definitely hidden within these ivory towers of the market research or the insights team. 
Um, and just how I think with you know digital performance, we've seen data and analytics sort of start in its own department and slowly become part of everybody's day job. Um, I can't really think of any modern um, you know division of the workflow where people aren't owning their analytics and data for their particular function. And I think we're seeing a sim similar dissemination of uh, consumer research know-how. So literacy is definitely getting higher. Um, access to tools that democratize, you know, these types of studies. Um, you know, what what used to only be done by you know large agencies doing this for CPG brands, you see more and more of these brands trying to be nimble and do it themselves. But not all of their consumer research, just like how we mentioned, how not all consumer research can be cut into being fast and and, and dirty. Um, but more and more teams are kind of taking ownership of that. Yeah, I think your perception is, you know, certainly grounded in in truth that a lot of the times market research is arduous, it is lengthy, it can be expensive, but there's certainly a lot of automation happening in our industry today that is helping um, brands to, to bring that consumer into the room earlier and much faster and so on. Elliot, you've mentioned in the past um, that you know, minimum viable products are very easy in the digital world and, and less so in consumer packaged goods. But could you maybe elaborate a little bit on minimum minimum viable brands and products in CPG? Yeah, so my background working in tech, there tends to be this idea that if you want to go build something, the concept of MVP has shrunk to be smaller and smaller and easier and faster to do. Whatever you can get out the door, door as soon as possible and start validating your kind of make or break hypotheses and assumptions around your, your business, the better. Um, it'll uncover if you have to pivot, it'll show you if you have something good on your hands, and then it'll show you what you need to improve if you're, if you're not so good. Um, a lot of that is really afforded to the fact that digital products are um, are coded. So really, at, at its very smallest, it could just be like a landing page with, you know, putting your email in to sign up for a wait list to show that people have demand for something. Um, and that's been very, very successful in the, in the tech world for um, validating concepts of launching them. In the consumer packaged goods world, you're obviously, you're constrained by the fact that you're dealing with physical goods. I mean, you can't just, you know, just say tomorrow, I'm going to launch a brand and start, you know, if people want to buy like my my very early version of our product, that's something we want to move towards. But you can't really. Product manufacturing is expensive. Minimum order quantities are high. Research and development and claims and legal and there's so many things that do have sort of they have a time box that you need to kind of allocate for. That being said, I think that and I mentioned this before in this CPG world when you think about launching something, a lot of the old school rhetoric is just it's really time boxed to like three years two years one year and like it it's it's very difficult to imagine breaking that mold if you're deep within the system if you're within the box and you know how everything is slow and you know how teams um interact with each other you you might also drink the kool-aid and think it's not possible i am of the school of thought that um, a lot of that is inefficient. A lot of that is um, simply just kind of maintaining the status quo. There are ways to kind of, if you have access to consumers early on, like I said, with our validation cycles, to bring people in and sort of create the equivalent, like with a minimum viable brand with a physical good. Is it going to be something you can throw up in a day with a landing page and some media traffic? Probably not. A little bit more complex, but I definitely it's something that we're trying to work towards. Yeah, that's great. Um, th we've mentioned already that there are obviously very different skills that might be needed in the future of market research than even just a few years ago. And, you know, Elliot, you, you raised some really good points there about, you know, your skill set coming into um, a large CPG company. What kind of new skills do you think are needed and what do we still need to bring in to, for us to, to be kind of successful as market research innovators in the future? Jeff, I'd love to kind of start with you on um, yeah. You know, I think I think the interesting area of um, you know we always sort of look at skills as soft skills and hard skills, and I think if we can combine a lot of those, that uh, uh, that that becomes more important. Especially since most of the what we do in the world that's interesting is somewhere in the middle. It's never really on the extremes on either side. But I think um, you know the term empathy is thrown around quite a bit, but I think that is a, a huge skill, especially in the predicament that we're in now, trying to understand how people behave. Um, I think for many years we used that term, but it's even more difficult now to really understand what people are going through 
Um, they may not want to share a lot of that information publicly. Um, they may sort of say in surveys that they're happy with the systems that are sort of intact that your company has come up with. It really is interesting because I think in true market research, you can get an idea of really how people are behaving based on their behavior and then also them validating that claim. I also think it's important to understand how people find information. I think we have a tendency of uh, downgrading that. We um, Many companies um, have this belief system that all of their owned and operated properties are, are sort of gold. That's where everyone finds out information. What we're starting to see, and, and we've known for many years, is that's not true whatsoever. Most people find out through third party uh, information. This is why branding, as, as we know it, is very, very important. And yet what's, what's happened over the last decade, most companies have cut down on branding because they believe it's not important at all because it's harder to track. Uh, so then when people actually go make a decision, they are thinking basically of the brand that uh, you know someone has noted to them. And this is basically on in both B2B and B2C. We have a tendency of thinking that there's no emotion in B2B. But if you ask a, you know, people a number of questions, especially if they're in charge of, let's say, spending millions of dollars on a cloud server, and then they tra and they traveled quite a bit, ask them who they saw advertising for in the airport. And I'm sure that they'll validate and say it was a company that uh, you know, is not the one I work for that's based in Seattle. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved uh, in terms of, of, of what's going on. But I think empathy, as well as understanding, for lack of a better term, search engine optimization. And what I mean by that is how people search for things across, you know, a variety of landscapes, including just talking to people that they know is really, really important in, in terms of our skill set on, on, on market research. Yeah, really interesting point there. Um, obviously, Elliot, you work for a very different type of company. Are there, are there skills that you think need to come into market research in the future in the future um, that maybe haven't been addressed in the past? Um, I'm definitely going to agree with the empathy one. Um, I think data, consumer research, like I said, it's a performance enhancing drug and not to beat the metaphor, but you still have to go and hit the home runs. The steroids aren't going to win the game. But mm -hmm. um, also, I think decision making is an underrated skill. And what I mean by that is like when you're in, when you're operating a, a brand, a, pro a product, whatever whatever you're in charge of, you still have to be able to make decisions quickly, frame experiments, and kind of go into them with an open mind that can be. I, I always say it's uh, strong beliefs loosely held. So yeah. you have to you have to have that mindset, and that kind of layers down into experimentation and everything, which is becoming another buzzword you see around the industry. But I think experimentation, you know, we've all been doing science reports since since middle school. That's not so much the the, the skill you have to get here; it's the ability to kind of frame things as experiments. Um, I'm trying to think, of another one comes to mind here. Um, yeah, I think it's like some form of an experimental mindset, a growth mindset mixed with empathy. Um, yeah. For sure, those are things that are really going to make the the next marketer stand out. Tools and hard skills they come and go. They become easier. They become automated. It's all. It's great to have those things. I'm not saying that they're secondary, but ultimately, what's going to make you stand out is kind of those like macro skill sets. You know, you yeah. bring up a good you bring up a good point though, Elliot, in terms of like the curiosity factor. Like if you think about what's going on in the world right now, and I hate to bring this up, but like why are we mired in some of the situations we have right now? Because we don't want to ask like the difficult questions and realize that science and data can be dirty. And dirty meaning like it's not the not the end all be all. I, you know, I think uh, all three of us might be able to agree that one of the things that's been difficult is this, this absolutism that that sort of exists out there where people think, hey, we'll do an experiment in research and that's the definitive answer. No, that's sort of just leading you in a direction, but you know, humans still have to make those big bets or those calculated risks, something that we, uh, we still haven't gotten right, I think, in business culture. I also, I just thought of a third one that I was also piggybacking off of one of your responses is the whole concept of what you were saying about like search engine optimization, but speaking broadly, not a particular channel. I think being able to design for channels and have a brain that thinks that way is also very important. There tends to be kind of uh, this, you know, bias and mindset among marketers, like everything is is the same. 
you know, Facebook, Pinterest, Google, you put money in and somehow you get traffic and whatever, we really see how the performance is on the other end, but it's not, you know, Pinterest is an inspiration engine. Google is a search mm -hmm. engine, like all of these things, Amazon. And if you can kind of start thinking like a consumer and how they approach these different, you know, arenas and how they, how they interact with these, what are they searching for? What is their intent? You're, it, it really doesn't matter what the channel is in question. 10 more channels could pop up next year. You just got to start thinking, okay, how do we design something that can perform well on multiple channels and is designed for that channel? It does make your time, your work a lot harder because now you're thinking one marketing objective has to be split across all these channels. But if you have the mindset to design per channel, breaking them down further and further just makes your strategy that much stronger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know it's why a lot of kind of you know, the, the fragmented universe as we're becoming, we're looking at different channels, we're shopping in different um, modes, etc. And it's it's far less about kind of looking at what the, the most successful concept is. It's about for who, who is that concept most successful for? And so sometimes you know, norms can be tricky in that if you're servicing everybody, you're servicing nobody <laughs> in a way. Um, we've talked about those those new skill sets needing to come in. Um, of course, you, you're both uh, clients of, of Suzy and other agile tools, I'm sure. So how has a company like Suzy um, and other agile technologies that you've been using, how have they helped you shift from that kind of old school perception of market research? And how are tools like ours helping you to adapt for the future of consumer insights? And Jeff, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think the big one is, you know, and in the area where I try to influence, it's really people who are uh, you know media planners, people who buy advertising or buy marketing. So it's really you know m my role is understanding not just you know every digital channel that's out there, but every channel that's out there. You know no matter what it is, because you have to think about if someone can purchase media to amplify, you have to understand how all these things interconnect, and that means you have to understand how consumers you know make their decisions. And a lot of times we have a tendency of forgetting about, you know, how are people influenced and, and Susie for, for, you know, our team has been helpful in terms of asking a number of questions that we want to, you know, maybe correct or test our innate bias on. Like you have a, you have a tendency, I think, in, in, in industries to hear tall tales that become truth. You know, one is that no one pays attention to any advertising. That's something that you see all the time. I mean, that's an innate bias, usually pushed by many people. So you have to ask a lot of questions of consumers on what made you make a decision? You know, was it a combination of things? Was it this one factor? You know, what are the things that you pay attention to when it comes to making a decision? You know, when we think about the fact that, you know, consumer packaged goods that are, uh, uh, let's say, with a lower cost, uh, you may ask less people for validation. Things that have a higher cost, you're asking more people for validation. You know, there's a number of areas that we that we that we try to understand because no organization, no you know, no human is the same when it comes to a lot of their decision making process. And so, you know, we've used Suzy not just to really validate a lot of our own uh, data, but really to sort of course correct. You know, hey, do we have an is there an innate bias? Are we believing something that we should you know, correct or can we validate? Let's go ask people. And many times we found that we've been wrong on things. And I think that actually is is good. I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people when, you know, you're wrong. Again, we're in a culture that, you know, we've been trained since we were young that if you're wrong, that you have no value in life, that you have no value in society. But one thing in business is if you're wrong, you actually can make, you know, course correct, which is, which I think is really important in terms of, uh, um, you know, the validation process in terms of, you know, how you set your market up for uh, or how you set a product up for success. So I think a lot of what we've used the tool for is is really checking sort of the biases that are out there and a number of, of, of consumer patterns, what people are actually doing when it comes to decision making, uh, when it comes to purchase behavior. Yeah, for yeah. sure. It's about failing early and failing fast. Elliot, what's your experience of agile tools like Suzy's and how has it helped you kind of frame market research in 2020? I think you just, you need to increase the volume of learning points, right? So before, I think if you go back like decades and decades, like Don Draper mode, and you have this like, okay, we're going to get all of our questions answered. 
in this big bulky consumer research thing and then we're going to go to market and everything's going to be great because we answer the questions and we go i think if you did that nowadays you think you're at the top of the mountain but then there's just far more false peaks you know you have way more work to do and because of that i think I think something you have to start off with is kind of sit down and whiteboard a lot of the assumptions you have. And those assumptions can split up into hundreds of things, opportunities to test, whether it's validating something um, or whether it's trying to uncover uh, questions or assumptions, further assumptions about what you're trying to, um, to create all the way down to kind of identifying fringe uh, use cases of your product or um, even niches you didn't know that loved you. Um, mm -hmm. There's just more and more opportunities for learning. Um, and it's up to you to kind of increase, to use tools that are like kind of like a rapid access, uh, I don't know, a tool, a, a tool that allows you to kind of do these things rapidly um, mm -hmm. to just increase the volume of tests that you're doing. Yeah, that's great. Patrick H, one of our audience members here, has a great uh, term for this, assumption storming, which is, uh, I've not heard that phrase before, it's wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I guess we do assumption storming all the time, but it's like, <laughs> it's awesome. That's that's one of my favorite things to kind of do with a team if you're starting off really, really early, get like a really diverse set of experts within your organization to sit down and really just whiteboard out the assumptions. Not to, I think that not to poke holes in your concept and kind of sink the ship, I think this is more to to right the ship and go towards yeah. your ultimate goal. And I think that that requires a sort of, you know, you have to throw the ego away at the door to come into scenarios like that and really take those assumptions with it with, uh, to heart and kind of go and test them. That requires you to take the armor off a little bit and say, okay, I'm not gonna hold a lot of the decisions that we've made so dear when we could probably make tweaks here and there that completely change the outcome yeah absolutely and it is interesting as market researchers we're kind of like it is it a or is it b do we launch a or do we launch b and amy s and our audience asked if segmentation is more important than now than ever and i would absolutely say that's what a lot of our clients are saying to us is it's not just a or b it's who is a designed for who will buy b who is b designed for and it's not just about creating homogenized products for homogenized audiences that's not who we are today <laughs> i got a i got a comment for someone in the comments said not to just agree with the hippo or the highest paid person's opinion <laughs> I have another one for you that you should use. We call them zebras, and that's uh, zero evidence, but really arrogant. You know, <laughs> there is there is zebras everywhere, and it's like not even knowingly. I mean, there's people who who probably have a track record of making a lot of great decisions, mm -hmm. but now that you have access to essentially ask these questions at will instead of kind of resorting to how things used to be and just defaulting to whoever in the room is loudest, um, just take those with a with a grain of salt. Yep. It's a jungle out there. You've got to avoid the hippos and zebras. The zebras um, in England. <laughs> Um, so thinking about what you've what you've both been through in in 2020, what have been some of the the biggest learnings that you've learned about your specific consumers in 2020? And Jeff, yeah. I'd love to start with you there. You know, it's interesting. I think there's been a ton of think pieces out there. How um, a lot has changed in a small amount of time. Um, you know, there's a term for that that Alvin Toffler came up with in the 70s. It's called future shock. You know, psychologically, it's hard to make all those changes. And therefore, people basically suffer shock like you would if you go into shock, you know, physically. One thing we found, and this was through a lot of our research that we used with um, uh, different segments and different consumers, was for how much has changed, a lot has actually stayed the same. So, you know, one area, Katie, that we found is that we asked people, you know, how do you still enjoy shop? You know, what, how do you like to go shopping for particular goods? Mm -hmm. Some goods people were buying online and buying more of them online. But we found that people actually enjoyed still getting in their car, depending on where they lived in the world, and driving to the store, even though they did not enter the store. It was a, it's a term called focus, buy online, pick up in store. Mm -hmm. And what we realized is that's built into an innate human behavior that if you're inside all the time, if you're sort of behind closed doors for long periods of time, you need to you, you, you have this yearning to get out into a public place, even if that public place 
was just in your car to drive to the department store to pick something up, or in the case we found here, groceries was a big area where people still liked to drive to the store and have the groceries picked up that they were delivered to their car. So even though there's a lot of think pieces out there that everything has changed and we're past sort of the 66 days of uh, habit forming and you know the world is totally different, you know, that's not necessarily the case. Again, a lot of that is rooted in a neat bias. It's rooted in people who have a large population on social media and can say silly things like cities are dead or that no one is interested in the arts or that people aren't going to build anything fascinating. I mean, the, I mean, it's like if we could make money off of all of those ridiculous predictions, we could all retire after this, uh, you know, webinar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that you know, ties into to Matt's presentation this morning where he mentioned the cities are definitely not dead. And we, as humans, miss out on those um, serendipitous moments if we're just, you know, having very purposeful conversations with people we literally reach out to. So just going to that parking garage, going to the grocery store, it, it brings back that kind of life, um, as it were. Um, what about uh, yourself, Elia? What have you learned about your consumers in 2020? Yeah. Um, I think one thing I want to just jump on there is what Jeff was talking about, people still wanting to go uh, shopping. And I, I always think like when people try to argue that everything's gone e-com, it's like you and you, if you're an e-com owner of a store, in 99% of the situations, you have no chance against Target's average order value. If you're talking about the value of the basket that people are, if people go to Target to pick up one thing and end up spending hundreds of dollars. That's right. Uh, they like, buy a TV, they buy a Casper pillow, like <laughs> everything is kind of catered to them. So like slow your, slow your road. But I think we have seen like five years of e-commerce adoption happen in five months. So it's kind of like both things can be true. We can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. So I think what you have to bear in mind there is for your particular brand, what is the shift happening for you? Don't look necessarily what's happening for someone else. What's like the, I think, you know, everyone's trying to be like, how do I make a viral TikTok video? And it's like, they didn't even produce that. That was completely serendipitous and of the moment. Um, kind of just assess what's changing for your consumer and your category. And now you don't really have the opportunity to, to roll that out in a year or two years or something. Your innovations are kind of gonna have to pick up. Um, and that's kind of a variation of designing for channel that I previously talked about, but also just like, you'd be crazy to think that nothing has changed in the last couple of months. Um, and whatever tactics you were using 2018, 2019, probably, it probably needs some work in 2020, 2021. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take a question from the audience that was just typed in. It actually relates to the next question that I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you both. Um, we've obviously seen a huge increase in market research that's available, uh, white papers, um, et cetera, a lot of insights during COVID. So two-part question. How do you make sure that the impacts that you are creating are really making an impact on your company? But also to tie that into the question from the audience, how do you deal with those, I guess, zebras and hippos and those execs who still believe that we live in a land where TV is king and, and digital might not be able to show true ROI? So I guess it's about bringing yeah. a relevant impact to the right people. Large question. So apologies. It's kind of a two-parter and Jeff will get started uh, with you there. I mean, I guess on that first part, or, you know, when you do a lot of research and one of the things we look for with validation is, you know, there's some things that, you know, you might be higher up, like, hey, 90% of people have validated that they are doing X, Y, or Z. What we find interesting are the things that are on the cusp. 16% of people did this. Last month, that was 8%. And then next month when you test it, it's grown to 20%. That means that particular behavior, Katie, is growing and should be paid attention to. We have a tendency of looking at the things that are already entrenched at like 80 or 90% and saying, let's write an insights piece on that. Why? Most people probably already know about that. What you want to look at is the behavior that's actually trending in sort of the niche areas that may go somewhere and may not go somewhere. I mean, a good example, again, is, uh, you know, things that we're seeing in terms of how people are behaving with when it comes to retail. What we've found is 
it's pretty much the same, but they're spending longer periods of time actually on their decision-making process. So they, so that actually requires marketers to think, wait a minute, if people were taking three months and now they're taking five months, how are we standing out out there when it comes to their entire decision-making process? So the, 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 the areas that, that, people are, are making decisions are longer. That requires more work on behalf of a company to actually you know, stay front and center during this entire period of time. There's other areas though too that we've seen uh, you know, validated in terms of people are using their laptop a lot more. We talked a lot about this. So it doesn't mean that they're not using their mobile phone. It's just that when you're not having to rely on your mobile phone for the things that you took for granted before the pandemic, you have a tendency of just using devices a lot more than usual. One thing we're also seeing is people are using their large screen TVs connected to the internet to watch things. This has led to the demise of one company who actually took on a billion dollars who thought everyone wants to watch something on a small device that's only two minutes long. So a lot of things that we can basically show or what we've shown, you know, this past year is is it's been very interesting to see a number of things that, um, uh, you know, are on the trending edge. It's just curious to see where those could be going. And those are the things that people want to hear about. You may not be right in terms of predicting where those are going, but if something is growing from 10% to 20%, to 23% month over month, that's something that is obviously cascading and you should write an insight about that. Yeah, you make a great point that disruption comes from the fringe. I, I know that we've talked in the past, you said nothing popular stays for very long, <laughs> I believe you said. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah, like nothing pop, yeah, there's no lasting value in things that are popular because everyone basically accepts those. You know, if something's at 90% and you go write a think piece on that, there's probably a billion other thing pieces out there on that. You don't stand out at all. Yeah. And so for you, Elliot, obviously it's a fast moving consumer goods product set that you're working for. Um, how do you make sure that the, in, that the insights that you're looking at really make impact um, on your company? And actually just yesterday I heard about a very fridge product named Cheese Tea. Now as a British tea drinker, cheese in my tea does not <laughs> appeal to me, but would love to know a little bit more about how you're kind of focusing on, on bringing insights in that will make impact long-term for the company. So I think I can answer both part one and part two, the question, the old part two is like, how do you convince zebras and hippos that you're doing something? Mm -hmm. I think it actually has this very similar answer and that's using make, if you have someone who's telling you to do something, you think it's not backed and it's just someone pulling it, you know, out of their head, use experimentation to the same ends, you know, make them walk the walk. I've done this all the time. I think with paid media where you have someone who thinks that this type of creative will perform this type of number. Sure. Let's put it up. Sometimes it performs and it's in their favor. Sometimes it completely tanks and, you know, you get some bragging rights. But it's it's really about um, you have to be consistent. If it's if you're going to be using a certain type of methodology for your tasks with consumers in the wild, just try to bring that back into how you work internally as well. I mean, you can't really argue with the numbers at that point with a really well-designed experiment that shows the impact and the output of what variant A does versus variant B, you kind of have everything in your favor to make an argument. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I will take a question from the audience here. So um, guest 964 asked, before the pandemic, fragmentation and personalization were driving media and marketing choices. But COVID has meant that our experiences have become more homogenized than before. So in counterpoint to a lot of what we've already been saying um, on this assumption, uh, does our shared experience start to reignite interest in mass media and mass messaging? And Jeff would love to start with you, obviously this is your specialist area. Yeah, you know, when you think about like, the, we lived in a monoculture for many decades and then that was split apart. And 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 in all the think pieces about the uh, TikTok dreams, ocean spray video, one thing was missing that no one talked about. That only works right now because everyone is looking for joy. Everyone is looking for a shared experience. They cannot get because of all the fragmentation out there. I hate to bring up an a silly thing like you know a TikTok video to make that assumption, but I think we want more shared experiences. Ted Lasso, why is that such a popular show on Apple TV? 
because it's something that brings a lot of people joy. It's a funny show. It's relevant to a lot of different audiences. Even if you don't like professional Premier League soccer, you can find something in that. I think that is, uh, you know, there's something here that actually might be a trend that I want to actually research, which is, is there more of a need for a monoculture again, for the fact that we're all in these little, you know, we're all in our sort of homes just doing what we're doing and we're yearning for sort of that uh, connection again. Um, you know, if you think of the last pandemic a hundred years ago, we had the roaring twenties, people came out and danced, you know, sort of, you know, uh, lived again, uh, you know, read a great piece that said, you know, concerts could be bigger than ever after this because people really want those shared experiences. So I think, you know, those are things that we should pay attention to. We should be privy to, especially in a world where there is too much discussion around personalization and hyper targeting. And this is made for you. If, you know, if you can't share any of these experiences, you know, it sort of brings dread. We're all looking for joy again. I would actually try to build something that in some like mass audiences again. I think that now is the perfect time to do it. Yeah. Oh, I love that, Jeff. And actually, Dreams by Fleetwood Mac was always my go-to karaoke song, so I'm very glad it's made a very large comeback on TikTok. <laughs> so changing kind of track a little bit um, for our last couple of questions, um, what new innovations have you seen in market research in 2020 that you're excited to see stick and grow in 2021? And Jeff, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one area is just um, how uh, how more people who maybe don't come from a marketing research background uh, can do market research, the democratization of research, like we like to call it. It sort of reminds me of the bring your own device movement from, uh, you know, the, the mid 2000s. Um, everyone was able to communicate better because they basically brought their device and IT hooked it in and we were able to sort of, you know, email each other and text each other and do other things. I think, you know, we're there. There's a movement needed now where uh, research isn't just for the R and D department. It reminds me of almost the movement a couple of years ago where people said, you know, marketing isn't just for the marketing department. Everything that you do is sales and marketing. I think it's the same thing now with where we are in research. We need more people who don't necessarily have big data machine learning backgrounds involved in asking and answering more questions you know that uh, leads to curiosity that figures out if there's a market fit for products that thinks about all the inclusive audiences that are out there and you only get that when you basically involve more people so i i, I hope that is a trend that picks up next year um and people, uh, you know, I think once people aren't afraid of doing something and they can use a software as a service tool uh, that allows them to do market research, it just becomes, it, it just spreads far and wide to a lot more people who never would consider themselves uh, in the field of market research. Yeah, I couldn't say it better myself. What about you, Elliot? What trends have you seen in market research in 2020 that you're excited for for, for next year? So my background when I worked in tech was like, totally remote, not work from home. Personally, I'm not really a work from home person. I'd love to have a space to go to. But um, what I think that shocked a lot of big organizations and large projects within them is the ability to do so much work digitally. And I don't think it's kind of like 100% or zero, right? We're not talking about a future that's purely digital, but now we know how much that can be done thanks to technology, thanks to distributed teams. And that really empowers a lot, a lot of great work. That being said, I think it's also illuminated how many things do require face-to-face, in-person work. Um, whereas before we might have kind of bucketed everything has to be, you know, an in-person workshop, flying everyone out to New York to do it. Um, where that's kind of that's definitely not something that's going to flow into the future. Yeah. I think the second thing, like Jeff was talking about, where we've seen data kind of migrate from a specialist department within your organization to being you know, part of everyone's day job. And that, that was a slow burn. I think where it started in the 2000s where you had SaaS that enabled different departments to have data on their operations. But it took you know, a really, really long time before products and SaaS companies came out that really, really spoke to different people's, um, what, whatever hat they have to wear in their day job. So I think the same thing is happening with consumer research. Um, and it's a pretty new 
pretty new thing that's happening. I think that that's not something that was conceived, you know, 10 years ago. It's something that's happening in the last couple of years specifically. Um, what I'm really, really excited about is a mixture of the two things I just talked about is building out the stack for the modern brand marketer. So where I think for a really long time, brand marketers kind of had this management role where they worked with a really complex matrix of different functions, agencies, inside, outside, whatever, and kind of led a project with them. Um, now we're seeing more and more of these functions being given back to the brand marketer because thanks to technology, you can do paid media within your brand as opposed to using an agency at record, or you can run consumer research studies within your small brand team as opposed to hiring out uh, a fancy consumer research agency to do it. Um, and I think more and more functions are going to become like that. And I also think similar to how the digital work versus in-person work, it's not 100% and zero or 50-50, it's, it's however works for you. I think the same thing will happen with um, these functions. I'm not saying that you know you should break up with all the agencies that you're working with to do those things. I'm just thinking that the agency relationship moving forward will probably be a lot healthier and a lot more focused on um, output and agility um, versus kind of defaulting to them as comfort. Yeah, you raised some great points there. Um, and I just want to raise a, a phrase that uh, one of our audience members said, which is we've obviously talked about democratized research, but inclusive research that brings in all of the key stakeholders. So the inclusivity of research, I think, will be really key for next year. We just have a couple of minutes left. So I would love to kind of ask both of you, what advice would you give to other business leaders that are maybe in your category and how they can adapt? And Jeff, very big question to end on. Um, but what advice do you have for, for people within your category? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the and this came up earlier, you know, Elliot and I were talking, we were all talking about it, you know, the, the, the ability to, you know, test and be wrong on things, I think is important. You know, if you think about, you know, innovation, a lot of innovation, a lot of art is really based on taking risk. And a lot of risk is based on being wrong. And again, it's not a matter of being wrong and saying, well, you know, you're wrong or you're incorrect on this. So let's, you know, have someone else do this. Really, it's taking that learning and saying, hey, I think we're wrong on this. How do we correct for it? How do we make our products, services, solutions, you know, better in these areas, uh, you know, for, you know, for people at the end of the day? I think that uh, that's something that, you know, research has always tried to go after. But I think if you can take that approach of, uh, you know, hey, we have, we know absolutely nothing and really, you know, almost wear that on your sleeve. That uh, works a lot better in 2020, 2021 than uh, I know everything, which is usually the uh, culture of, of, of business, which I think, uh, you know, doesn't really get you to move from point A to, to point B very well. Yeah, and one of our guests actually echoes that slightly. She says that there's an interesting conundrum at her company. There's maybe no outside thinking, and uh, and it's all internal um, thinking. So I think I would suggest to, to guest number five seven two that start thinking: How can I prove ourselves wrong um, here rather than look for for what's right? And that's a really good point because that's I think one of the examples of what the like evolved relationship with agencies to be moving forward is bringing in diversity of thought is you know highly underrated. Um, it's something you should consider. And if that's why you're approaching kind of outside help, that gives it a lot more dimension. And I think my answer to um, the newest question that you asked is like, if I was to speak to other leaders, I have a bias, and, you know, I could be wrong about this one, but for me, like third party data is, you know, really pretty pictures, but first party data is what, you know, makes the bacon. So we have an acronym we use all the time, and that's GOTB, and I'll drop it in the chat, is for get out the building. So when you can, when you adopt an experimental mindset, you want to launch tests and kind of test all your hypotheses, get out there and get first party data. There's no magical data source research agency out there that's publishing reports that you're just going to be able to take and then just go in and, and execute against it. Um, the first party data that you will acquire in your activities is actionable, it's directional, and you can kind of, you can, you trust it more because you know the full story. 
Um, you don't want to just latch on to a really, really pretty 45 page report just because it looks really influential. You think that everything there is like, you have to follow it like the Bible. It's just never going to be the case. And this happens also internally. And I think this is like what I would say um, the insights departments of the future have to evolve to is really around storytelling. Because now that there's a plenty, to, there's way too much data. There's way too many reports within your organization. Likely, you're not the first person to ask a particular question. You're not the first person to go into a particular category or niche. There's so much work there. The problem is, ultimately, decision makers are still human, and they're not going to read through all of that. So we have to find a way to better tell those stories and disseminate them within organizations so that they are actionable and directional, and people can kind of put them to work instead of reading your 45-page report and leaving with more questions than when they entered. Yeah, here, here. Thank you so much for ending on that incredibly um, important topic. And thank you so much for also sharing all of your phrases. So I love the uh, get out of the building, zebra, hippos. It's certainly a jungle out there that we need to, to watch out for. With two minutes left, I'm going to hand back to Avi Savar, our president, who will introduce you to what's happening for the rest of the day. Avi, if you're there, would you like to, to step up?